The only way to get to the airport was through the village of Piski. Each time was a 50-50 shot. We held both the old and new terminals, the fire station and the flight control tower. The battles near the Donetsk airport never stopped. There was a mission to assault the enemy's stronghold, outpost Monastir. This war, well, it was planned long ago, 10, 15 years back. The rulers of the Russian Federation already had plans for a war in Ukraine. The last two ministers of defense were Russians. They did everything to destroy our army. When we left the Soviet Union, we had about 460,000 in the armed forces of Ukraine. During the last 20 years, we had shrunk to 80,000. And at the time of the war, we had about six to 7,000 combat units. Well, it was destroyed by someone. We had our hands tied so much by various regulations, it was impossible to fire a single shot without a command from above. We had relocated all troops from the area around Donetsk and Luhansk. We no longer had anybody there. At the time, volunteer battalions played a very important role. When I arrived, for about a month I was trying to find out which volunteer battalions were there. All commanders gathered. They sat down with me at the command post and talked. We made the right decisions. Sometimes I listened to them and changed my mind. Sometimes they listened to me. We came to an agreement together. And I think they also played a very big role, both in the defense of the airport and the defense of Piski. And when I was short on people, when I took out the wounded, but there was nobody to bring in any more, I asked for help from the OUN battalion, the Nunipur 1, the right sector, and all those guys came for help. It was also very nice to work with the Karpatska Sich unit. Most of them were ideological. These were people who knew what they were going for and why they were dying. If everyone had their minds made up the same way as they did, we would have ended the war here a long time ago. The story of the battalion itself goes like this. The battalion was located on the border towards Luhansk. Then the battalion was reorganized. It went to Savor Mohila, and suffered very heavy losses there. And after Savor Mohila came the Ilovice Cauldron. So I had to reconstitute the battalion for a third time. On October 29th, the battalion entered the ATO zone to carry out its assigned mission. The battalion took control of the settlements of Karlivka, Tonenki, and Piski. The third mechanized company was also ordered to conduct missions at the Donetsk airport. The 
The only way to get to the airport was through Piski, through the takeoff runway. By all accounts, there were about three kilometers of runway. On our right and left was out of our control. Behind the airport fence were enemy positions with SPGs and ATGMs. They were constantly shooting at us. Enemy artillery did too. All the places where our combat vehicles could reach were already known to the enemy. Their weapons were well aimed and the firing positions were hidden. When our vehicles arrived there, they only had seven minutes for the personnel to load or unload the vehicle, to get out of the airport, transport the wounded and change shifts. We could only move at high speeds, exactly seven minutes to reload and retrieve. If they had stayed any longer, they could no longer get back. In every way, in or out from the airport, I can't describe how difficult it was. One tank lost a track, it got stuck on the runway, one IFV was wrecked. Then we realized that it was dangerous to approach in this way. We decided that it is necessary to take control of the village of Opetny. We conducted recon. Then a motorized infantry unit of my guys together with the guys from the right sector unit moved in. They cleared all the houses, all the streets, everything was checked. And after that, armored vehicles and infantry arrived and emplaced themselves there. First of all, it opened us a way to outpost Zenit. Because outpost Zenit held a full circular defense there, it was impossible to get in there before. We opened the road to Zenit. Then we took control of the high ground near the airport. First of all, from this hill we could get cover. We could cover our guys approaching the airport via the runway. There were only 25 of us. We moved all night. We walked right through the minefield, the tripwires, the tree line. We came from their flank, caught them by surprise, and we attacked them from their flank, knocked them out quickly, and that was it. Even now, it is the only height at the airport held by the Ukrainian army. Мент, 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 что у вас нормально? Они там снизу? Мент лежит, мент. Мент! Нормально! Быстро сюда наверх поднимай! Ребята, следующий зал по нам! Сразу проверяйте, все живы? Нормально. На нормально? Пасан. The first squad of the first platoon approached on November 9th. The second squad was wiped out. The third arrived on November the 12th. On the evening of the 12th of November, at 5 o'clock, we were already at the old terminal, already as part of the first platoon. When approaching the terminal, we were given the task just to stay there for a while and ensure everything was quiet. If 
You've also got to understand that the terminal itself was practically surrounded. It was exposed to fire from the south side, practically from the first floor to the roof. The eastern part was controlled by the separatists, and from the northern side, behind the runway, there was also positions from which they were shooting with small arms. There was well-armed fire by the enemy suppressing the second and third floors and on the roof. The only road which was 60 meters between the new and old terminal. It was completely exposed to fire. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, on November 29th, we heard an explosion and shooting. A round from an RPG flew in at us and slammed into the column over my right ear. At first, we thought it was a provocation, that it would all fizzle out and everything would remain in its place. But as the following events showed, it was already a purposeful assault. The attack began. We heard, wounded, we have wounded here. They blew up the wall. I ran there, saw a guy laying on his back covered in blood. I began to apply a tourniquet. I wanted to write on his forehead the time of the application with a marker. And he asked, don't write it on my forehead, but on my hand. I lifted up his glove and wrote on his hand, on the right one, no, on the left one, time of application with a black marker. But he didn't make it, he died. I saw that half of the second floor was empty. They retreated and bunched up downstairs. I left my post on the ground floor. I had my position at the bar. I ran and fired single shots. I reached the barricade, took up position and started shooting to the far end of the corridor. But there was absolutely no light, a dark end. That is, I shot blindly, at random, with single shots. My eight magazines were spent. I didn't know how to shout that my mags were spent. It meant I had to go back 20 meters. I would have been shot in the back. They shot at us from there, out of the darkness. So I shouted to the guys behind me. Guys, my position is downstairs. Whoever's position is this, go back to it. I need to be downstairs, at my position, on the ground floor. And while shooting my last mag, I swore at them. They ran up took positions and started. I said, single rounds, save ammo, and ran to reload. That was my mistake. I should have reloaded on the spot and handed it over to someone. We were inexperienced then. And at that moment, there was a powerful explosion on the second floor and screams, our guys were buried under, they're dead. The guys from the second floor ran up, said that one died, was buried under the wall. I saw Vitya Kazak, Everest and a crowbar. I said, Vitya, grab a crowbar, let's run and dig him out. I hoped that this man was still alive. There was a risk that separatists would capture him. I made it unarmed to the place where the rubble was and started shooting to the far corner. First at the corner, then at the middle, at chest level, with the single shots in the dark. They answered from there with something quiet because I saw the bullets hitting nearby, but there was no sound of shots. There was only a flash and bullets. The enemy who attacked us in this offensive was quite prepared. I think they were no ordinary soldiers. While I was shooting, I saw Vitalik laying on his back. The guys dragged him by the arms and legs, and I finished off my magazines and retreated. In the midst of the battle, they were looking for volunteers who would volunteer to cross the runway under fire during the battle and take out the wounded, otherwise they would die.
Второй этаж нормальный. Вот это, вот эта сторона. Сейчас надо эвакуировать раненого. Тяжелый его. Что делать? Так, а побежим. Туда? А побежим. Открыть. Побежим просто в этом время. У него два часа всего. Ну давай сейчас не Да там есть сейчас, ребята. Четыре человека послали. Четыре. Четыре много. Не знаю, но атаковать не надо. Двое. Отсюда будем прикрывать. The density of the fire was heavy, and we had to cross 60 meters of that road, which I had just mentioned. I heard behind me. I was shooting, and behind my back the boys called commentary as if it was a football match. They've gone 10 meters, gone 20 meters, gone halfway with the stretcher. On the first day, two men were killed and 10 injured. The next day, there were even more wounded. On the second day, my machine gun jammed completely. It hadn't been cleaned. We could not knock out cartridges from the chamber. I was already hammering a cartridge into the chamber. I was hitting the handle of the machine gun with a grenade or a magazine to make it shoot. Later, I just took someone else's machine gun and finished them off with it. Our ammo was almost out on the 762, on the PKM. Everything was already in use. Tracers, armor-piercing bullets, sniper rifle bullets. It didn't matter anymore how to shoot, but only to suppress the enemy. In the afternoon, we were hit with many incendiary shells, and the garbage caught fire. There was a lot of construction waste. There was plastic in different lining, all not fireproof, and it burnt well enough. The wind was blowing towards Donetsk. This smoke and fire did not bother us. In the evening, after dark, the wind abruptly changed and all the flames and smoke rushed into our last room. Almost instantly, the room was full of smoke and flames. We did not have the opportunity to go out to put out the fire, and they took advantage of that fire. And there was no place to hide. It turns out that all our barricades were mostly wood, plastic and wood. What are these terminals? This is a new one. Modern construction. There's mineral wool, molding, a lot of glass and a lot of metal, which only holds the construction. All of the rest. We held out until our ammunition caught fire. The walls were not yet on fire. At first we took out the seriously injured. Then I went out with Topol. Together with the main group, we went to the new terminal. On the 30th, at about 6 o'clock in the evening, we got out there, all of us. And when the other group came in to fight back, they came in and they saw that the walls were gone. All the walls burned down and there was nothing to even use as cover to hide your head. Все полностью разбито, все это регулярно обстреливается русскими танками и минометами. Then the issue of moving personnel through checkpoints of the IAG, illegal armed groups, was raised. My second run was on December 15th. Already through the separatist territory, we came through with shame and left with shame. But still we replaced our guys, at a time when it had already been critically needed. The boys got tired there as well. We changed our second platoon. Two vehicles coming out were being fired at. They punctured all the wheels, smashed the windows. 
І потім виникла одне із питань, що... And then the idea came up that if we took control of the meteorological tower, we could go to the airport directly. I went to the second company and said, guys, well, we've got to take it. They said, nothing will work. We are not able to hold it. Well, we had all of those, you know, meetings, conferences, and so on. I said, well, it's up to you. Either way, I'll drive the IFE myself and go there. And 10 more men hopped on with me. I was at the wheel replacing the IFE operator. They were on top of the armor. We drove in there. We set up a defense, checked everything, started the generator. We repaired the light and dug two shelters. Completely covered, masked, and that was it. I stayed with them for two days there at the meteorological tower, and two days later I left. не забудет этих патриотов. Then we already had two paths of approach to the airport, one from Piski and one from Opetny. We were then able to slightly deceive them. For example, in Piski, we would start heavy vehicles and tanks and start riding in circles. We created a commotion. They were expecting us there. And then we would get through the meteorological tower, transferred back and forth. Everything was well done. A good job. We usually went there in pairs, two tanks and two IVs. When the tanks worked all the time in winter, there were no problems. We would easily go in and out. The IFV and MTLB, multi-purpose light armored towing vehicles, are lightly armored vehicles. These reinforcements would not reach the terminal and would not bring them anything, and the wounded would not be taken out. But when a tank came out, everyone aimed immediately at the tank and let the reinforcements go through. It was a daily job. Their tanks would appear, and our tanks would start shooting at them. We would not allow them to go out and conduct aimed shooting at the airport. You've got a 180 degree front, so only your rear is safe. But left, right, and front are in the direction of the enemy. I remember one thing, that we were moving between both terminals and shooting at every flash. Well, usually, I was in a tank. If I saw something, I would aim and immediately fire. Bang. We had battles every day. 
But there was a very heavy fog and practically no visibility. There were tank duels, tank battles. Two, three tanks would drive out and shoot. Sometimes three full tank ammunition loads were used a day. All the time, we were covered by our meteors. We were grateful to them. They rarely let the enemy artillery do anything, because they would hit them fast. From the first to the last day of the defense of the airport, my unit covered our troops defending it. We were conducting counter-battery missions, identifying and suppressing the enemy's batteries, and covering our troops. The location of our artillery and the enemy artillery was like this. We were set in small settlements, villages, fields, and so on. The enemy was in Donetsk itself. Believe me, there were lots of people there on our side who were giving us clear coordinates of the enemy artillery positions. But if they shot from the city, from behind a house, we were not allowed to open fire on them. Our combat mission was to provide cover for the airport, namely artillery cover. Which we were conducting quite successfully, until this one story happened. Our battery was completely destroyed, several mortars were hit by shrapnel. Some had their aiming sights destroyed, some had the tube damaged. We also lost nine people out of 60. There was a platoon of the wounded. And there were 20 of us left, still mission capable. We got together with our two remaining mortars. And we helped as much as we could. We were shooting and firing quite successfully even. At first, we generally thought we were all enchanted to be bulletproof. Everything was flying around, whistling and hissing. Some stuff almost fell under our feet, and everyone stayed alive and well. I really thought we were enchanted. One of the most important combat missions was to protect the Donetsk airport. Being at the control tower, I spotted for the artillery fire. Almost all the artillery around Donetsk was dedicated to the battle for the Donetsk airport. At the airport, my friend and I could be on duty for up to 10 days, because after 10 days, the instinct of self-preservation starts to fade. Round the clock fire, that's it. You need to constantly hide somewhere, behind something. Plus the observers were climbing to the very top of the tower. One could see the outskirts of Donetsk from the tower. All the approaches to the airport were visible too. You could go up there, take a position. It's cold, windy, but you've got to lay down and watch. Targets, coordinates. You command the artillery battery to take out the enemy. Speaking about counter-battery combat, 
we definitely destroyed about 10 enemy artillery batteries. Well, other than that, it's not confirmed. For the enemy, this tower was like the thorn in their side. And they constantly tried to destroy this tower. The tanks moved 400 meters in front of us. We could see smoke and hear the rumble. They stopped in front of the tower and fired. Once to the tower, once at the old terminal, once at the new one. And so in this sequence, the anti-aircraft mountain covered them. They would shoot and then move away. It was almost impossible to hit them. It was very difficult because they were a moving target. We were chasing these tanks there for several days, but finally they got caught. I was given a choice to go to the high ground, 9317, but I had already been there. I hadn't been in the control tower, so I said, I will go to the control tower. I haven't been there yet. We stayed there for several days. We held the defense at the Bronia post. Then the separatists asked us to return the dead bodies to them. There was a minefield, and their deceased were laying there. They said they would not shoot and gave us 20 minutes to collect their guys, to later exchange for our dead. There were three people in total, in headshots and in green uniforms. And one was in a paratrooper's shirt. We checked their documents and it turned out that they were Russian. They were Russian tankers. It was the crew of a Russian tank. Then the guys remembered that the tank had been destroyed earlier and it was dragged away, but nobody knew where the crew was. The next day, a fire broke out in the tower. The tower was burned out completely. All our weapons burned up. After the attack at the control tower, the guys were hit and the ammunition caught fire. The rocket hit and all the ammunition that was there detonated. Everything burned up, ammunition, weapons, sleeping bags, and uniforms. Sergeant Major Tatsi jumped into the burning room and started kicking the mattresses, shouting, fire. I didn't understand what he was doing. It turned out the guys were sleeping in there, wrapped in mattresses, having bundled up from the cold. And he saved them. They were sound asleep and the room was completely engulfed in flames. Chitazi caught fire and began to burn like a torch from top to bottom. I couldn't extinguish it with anything. We had nothing but cellophane, no blankets, nothing. Everything was on fire. And then the medic ran up. He grabbed Edik by the shoulders like a cat, lifted and held him in the air, a hundred kilogram man, while he was tearing off his burning clothes. The fire was so bad that some people were literally left only in their underpants. And the only ammunition left was what they had in their magazines. And we ended up with one automatic rifle for seven people. Everything else was burning and exploding in the tower for about a day. The separatists didn't understand what was happening there and didn't bother us. At that moment, the floor was burning under us. The floor was so hot that the soles of our shoes burned and the ammunition exploded. I ran downstairs, leaving traces of fire behind me, like a genie. On a cell phone. Commander, what should we do? We have one automatic rifle and two mags left. And we have to hold the control tower. There is nothing else left. And the deputy commander, Rioja Kupol. That day the fog was so strong. And Rioja was making an arrangement with Motorola, the notorious separatist commander, to let us deliver weapons and everything else to our guys. I can say when I agreed to meet one-on-one, -on -one, 
The man with whom I negotiated, indeed, went out without a weapon, but behind him stood about 30 people with automatic rifles. I realized that the other side no longer cared, and if I just backed out, they would immediately shoot me. And while Kupel was standing there, shaking Motorola's hand, a Ural truck full of stuff, radios, ammunition, and food came from the side of the meteorological tower. Мы находимся на диспетчерской вышке. Проходит ротация ребят, которые в перемирии сепаратисты обстреляли. Тем самым и запалили их боекомплекты вещи, которые все сгорели. В процессе получилось, двое надышались угарным газом и один обжег ноги. Туман густой, пока активности сепаратистов мы не видим. Вроде-то проехали мы тихо, без стрельбы, но это не значит, что сейчас в ответ ничего не позвучит. Нам еще нужно разгрузить, назад машину отправить. Тайно завез боекомплект и вывез раненых в обход ополченцев. Приехали, отвлекли внимание, тут нам анекдоты порассказывали. Ну, получается, что так. Получается, что так, что из нас сделали дурачков. Доверие подорвано. Motorola says, well, let's go. Where to? Motorola says, you're my prisoner now. Oloha responds, no, I've never been to Donetsk and I don't want to go there. And then he took out his phone and called the brigade commander, Mikats. Comrade Colonel, Motorola is taking me prisoner. After they stood there, they tried to take Kupel to Donetsk, saying, you fooled us and so on. Well, maybe he did make them fools a little. Well, that's it, you know. The control tower was hit with a tank. When the upper floors were destroyed, two floors remained. Later the second floor was destroyed. When the control tower was completely destroyed, together with the paratroopers, we were holding the fire station. The last position was the fire station. We arrived at the empty fire station between the terminal and the control tower. There was a group of guys, shell-shocked and slightly wounded, who left the flight control tower. О, мы видим терминал, мы совсем близко, если завязывается какой-то бой серьезный, мы в течение 4-5 минут оказываем им свою помощь. Вот вы видите эту разбитую машину, это туры наши. Все в дыму. Видите, как все сыпется? Мужики, щита! Наш, наш, наш! Наш, да. наш! Наши бетеры, пацаны! О, с флагами! Ребята идут на штурм Бехи! Пришли пацанчики наши на подмогу! Будем живы! After Ilovais, the Donbass battalion was recalled to Dnipropetrovsk for reorganization. And then, when the elections began, we saw that the battalion command went into politics. We decided to transfer to the 93rd Brigade. 
I had a lot of guys who were originally from Donbass, from Donetsk proper. The guys fought for their land. People were motivated and couldn't wait to get into the hardest battles. And the 93rd Brigade, our task as a sixth company, was to assist with an assault on the enemy's stronghold, Outpost Monastery. Our task was to destroy the enemy and to hold the objective. The position did not allow convoys to pass from Piski to the airport. They fired heavy weapons and broke the connection between the terminal and Piski. The operation began around noon. We were told, there you will pass for sure. You will surpass the machine guns there easily. The main thing is to clear the area. As we arrived, it turned out that everything was not that simple. In front of us was a large two-meter wide ditch and a mound about three meters high. For an IFV, this is an impossible obstacle. The paratroopers landed and began to attack the enemy's position with the support of the IFVs. The enemy had heavy machine guns, but we were able to neutralize them in the first few minutes of the battle. We landed, quickly looked around, and had already begun to defend our combat vehicles. Then I saw a man running. I launched a couple of fragmentation grenades in there, as I thought he was dangerous, and he didn't run anymore. The coordinating group fell under mortar fire near the flight control tower. And my group of four IFVs broke through the enemy's position and destroyed it. During the assault, we lost two men. Twenty-four people were wounded. I was wounded five times during this assault. We were promised a reinforcement of 40 soldiers and some ammunition. They didn't arrive by the evening. We already understood that if we stayed there after dusk, it would be fatal for us. It was decided to retreat from this position at night, because there was nothing to hold it, no ammunition. But we arrived there in the daytime, when we could see our reference points. So instead of going to our side, as we were supposed to, we went towards Donetsk. The IFV operator was already driving, sticking his head outside to see where he was going, because there was zero visibility. And we drove onto the ice, rushed into the middle of the lake, and the IFE went under the water. The operator tried to drive it out, but nothing worked. We got a good bath there. Even our heads were wet. We took all the weapons we were able to carry. The separatists began to run around and shout, Come on, guys, bring the Utos here. The Ukrainian IFE was drowned. Nine of us got out. We split up into two groups. We went aside and started a fire. And the separatists thought there were only three of us, that this is the whole IFV crew. And the other guys were able to hide with the wounded. We spread out in the tree line. It was good that it was really dark. And they followed us. And the whole night we danced around there with them. They tried to catch us alive. And when it didn't work out, they decided to shoot at us with mortars. When we wandered at night, we accidentally appeared at a machine gun nest. But we were lucky that the machine gunner was just reloading. And when he saw us, out of fear, he was unable to close the lid of the machine gun. I wanted to shoot him with a grenade launcher, but it did not fire because it was wet. Since there was no time to stand and reload, we had to quickly vanish from there, because he was going to close the damn lid at some point. 
We didn't know where we were. We managed to contact our guys. I don't know his name. His call sign is Seraphim. By the reference points that I saw, he pinned down our location on the map and told us which way to move to get out. We turned on the phone and looked at the display. It said Artema Street, city of Donetsk. We decided to stay there for a while, to treat our wounded, and to plan a way out later. We found a basement. It was important to treat the wounded. We gave him injections, changed his bandages, and stopped him from bleeding. In the fog, we came up to a concrete wall, which had a hole in it, like this big. And a man stood there and asked, Who are you? I said, and who are you? Who knows? I didn't know where ours are and where the enemy is. He said, password. I said, what password? And he immediately raised his gun. And then I fired a couple of shots there, which I later regretted. Because they saw my shots flashes too. And they began to wallop us from all sides. So it was bad. A circle began to close around us. We called our side by phone and were told that they would give a red signal flare. And we sat there waiting for it for half an hour. Half an hour later, I called again and asked, where is your signal flare? It's getting cold here. And they replied, unfortunately, we have run out of signal flares. We will shoot into the sky from a large caliber. I turned my head and saw 12.7 caliber tracers shooting around me. I didn't get where to go, so I called back and asked them to raise the barrel 90 degrees up and shoot it somehow different from all this bang bang around us. And they lifted the barrel up from their position and opened it and made a short burst. Well, then I realized where to move. We are not far from there. On the fifth day, our wounded guy felt better, and we decided to go out. We heard by phone that the day before, the rest of our group had gotten back to our side. It gave us hope. We went on the move at night. We crossed the field, crossed the wood line. Then we saw two IFVs passing by and hid, and prepared to fight. But thank God, we noticed the Ukrainian flag on the IFVs. They had a wounded guy with them, with a bullet stuck in his lungs. Our guys were on their way back for six days, and they came back with their weapons. I'm proud of my men. The most painful days, when we lost a lot of people, both dead and wounded, were in January and February, when our soldiers were leaving the terminals. Our casualties at the airport were enormous. Shrapnel wounds, contusions. There was one day, really, I had a day when I only had 20 people left at the airport in the new terminal and there was no one else. There was no possibility to hold the airport anymore because there was nothing left.
In the third company, where there used to be 100 soldiers, only 17 remained. If only the terrorists knew that at the Moravainik position, we had just four people left. I was just placing Muha's other rocket and grenade launchers in position like this. And then I was just running around, firing them one by one, to make the terrorists think that there were plenty of soldiers here, so they wouldn't attack us. They were able to seize us with no weapons, just their manpower. We shot here and there and everywhere. Yes, that's how it was. And we continued to hold on. We were running around, holding the position, and all went well. Mostly, they were attacking us with tanks. The airport fell, many of our guys died. The meteorological tower collapsed. On the 23rd, they attacked us with all their strength. That means they used tanks. We were unable to counterattack. And there was a moment when we were hit and our ammunition was completely destroyed. All our stuff burned. And we sat there. I was in a trench with my last round of ammo. So I pulled the pin off of an F1 grenade. And with tears in my eyes, I turned to the guys and said, if you don't want to stay with me, leave now. When I was wounded, we were retreating. He gripped a grenade in his hands, Schmel himself, and said, Guys, get out, I'll cover you. But thank God, help arrived. Huh, that was scary. For two hours, I sat with a grenade in my hand, without a pin, with my last round of ammo, until the 2nd Battalion pulled us out. The battalion seized the area of Opetny, Vodinye, and Piski. The 6th Company occupied the so-called high ground position, Pulsar, which the separatists called Moravenik. The airfield was exposed to fire from this hill. It was the only Ukrainian Armed Forces unit that still remained on the territory of the airport. It's wrong to say that we completely left the Donetsk airport. Some of our units are still there. Well, if not for the airport, it would have been another objective. We held a favorable position there. It was okay for us to hold it. And the losses at the airport, other than those who were killed by an explosion when the airport fell, we had a lot of wounded, but many fewer killed. But from the airport, we were able to inflict a great deal of damage on the enemy. They tried to take it, we held it. And those who attack always take much more losses. On the separatist side, it happens like this. The gang comes after the battle to receive money for the airport seizure. The fewer people left after the battle, the more money their survivors would collect. For them, it was a way to make money. And after the flight control tower fell, by the order of the chief of general staff, we retreated to the positions we have nowadays. At that time, the brigade had already been conducting missions in the Donetsk area for about a year. In spring, I was assigned as brigade commander. Under my command, there was the 22nd Battalion, the 20th Battalion, which later became part of the 93rd Brigade, as well as the 11th Separate Motorized Infantry Battalion. Then two of my mechanized battalions from the Brigade, and one battalion which returned to the area of operation after a refit. It was already our second rotation, Butivka Mine, Zenit and Opotny. Thank you.
Budica mine, the concrete structures that the enemy turned into a second airport. It was necessary to hold it for operational and tactical reasons, because the road to Avdivka passed through it, as well as the direction in which both tank columns and armored columns would be able to conduct offensives. Therefore, holding positions like Outpost Zenit in Budovka mine can be considered the main direction of the enemy's efforts. On the night of May 13th to the 14th, we arrived on heavy equipment, part of which belonged to us and part of which belonged to the unit we were replacing. Right as we had thrown out all of our things from the IFV, the mortar fire began. I stood like this, wondering what was going on. I didn't understand anything at first. I realized it all in about two hours, as I saw my first 200. For me, the first three weeks were very difficult. All I wanted was to survive until morning. They tried to get us out of there in every possible way. We were just covered, we were just completely covered with concrete fragments. I think there were 45 people left at the mine at the time. The line of defense needed the full company staff. They had three hours rest, and then three hours of duty. They shot at us with 120 caliber mortars, tanks and artillery. In two weeks, all of the second floors disappeared. I had guys there, drivers and welders in civilian life, but they discovered themselves to be real warriors. Imagine people working to the limits of their human capabilities, especially considering tough weather and living conditions, and the undermanning of the unit. Then it was already clear that the Russian Federation was involved in this war. It supplies equipment and weapons. We already had found evidence, Russian documents and weapons. The infantry unit in front of us were real separatists, trained by professional instructors. They were not soldiers, but tankmen, artillerymen. These were real ones, Russian army regular soldiers. After the battle, we found two officers in the meteorological tower with Russian Federation documents and passports. And recently, a similar case happened at the Butivka mine. Near the company's headquarters, my soldiers shot a young soldier with Russian documents. We handed his body over in a Russian army bulletproof vest and a Russian helmet. Our guys did well, two wounded, one killed. The dead one was pulled out. He had a Russian passport and salary cards from a Russian bank. Literally 300 meters away, the industrial area of Donetsk begins. It's the city line, so everyone is constantly disturbed by the firing of shots. But we're holding on. Our fighting spirit is high. Nobody complains about anything. We have enough of everything. Volunteers visit us. Greetings to all my relatives and friends. I love you all. Greetings to everyone who knows me. We'll be home soon.
Then gradually the 22nd and 11th battalions went back under the command of their units. And in May, the entire brigade deployed to battle positions on the designated lane. At that time, it was the most intense area of fire. If there were 57 barrages identified over the whole ATO zone, 53 of them were in our area of operation. Near Avdivka, Butivka mine, Outpost Zenit, Piski, Vodinia, and Opetny. Мина! На! Видишь, в одно и то же место. На Вайдара там и Да, Следующая. Да, да, да. 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 Все, заряжаемся. Следующее. Вот он. По нашему же лупит. Может пойти посмотреть что-то? Тук, ты еще полезь. Ну как обычно. Ну как. Айдар, Айдар, ответь ромашки. Следующее. Следующий. Мина. Может быть, каждую минуту убьет, минометный обстрел. Сейчас идут до ребят узнавать, живы они или нет. Айдар, ответь малышу. Перебегаем быстренько. Даже оружие с собой не брал. Только аптечку на ногу. Вот вы видите, быстренько. Хоп. Первую помощь. Вот за них не была мина. Даже загорелось что-то. Мы ну сейчас. Надеюсь, все, все ребята... Все ребята живы! Бежим, 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 бежим! Смотрите, дядя! Оп! Как тут все живы, нормально? нормально все да. хорошо! И борги живот! Мужики, все живы? Да. Все нормально? Да. Двери где-то откройте! Заходи, заходи! Piski was just wiped off the face of the earth. We considered it as an artillery preparation for an offensive. As we took these positions, no one could even think of taking a step back. <laughs> <laughs>